Hello, everyone. For folks joining, we'll give it about another minute and then get started. All right, we can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the ELI's second or third actually summer school session this year, the basics of the Clean Water Act, but it is the second webinar um, summer school. My name is Madison Calhoun. I'm the Senior Manager of Educational Programs at the Environmental Law Institute. Each summer, ELI convenes a complimentary seminar series that offers an introduction to the legal and policy foundations of environmental protection in the United States. This series is aimed at folks who do not already have a background in environmental law. It's an introductory course into the basics and foundational elements of environmental law. No matter your background, uh, you're welcome to attend all of our sessions. We'll have a session of summer school every Thursday in June and July at this time from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time, except for June 29th. You can see on our PowerPoints um, the sessions that we've already held and all of our upcoming sessions as well. We will have two more sessions of summer school this year that will be hosted at our Washington DC office, land use and energy law next week and hazardous waste and sites at the end of July. All of our other sessions will be only offered via webinar like this one. All of our ses sessions are free, but you will need to register to attend each one on ELI's website. Um, each session will also be recorded and posted to ELI's website within a few business days of the event. So if you're unable to attend the in-person sessions, please feel free to watch them online a few days later. Please reach out to me or events at ELI.org if you have any questions at all. My email address is calhoun at ELI.org. Now we will go ahead and kick things off for today's session. Today's session is an introduction into the foundations of the Clean Water Act. In a moment, I'll hand things over to our wonderful moderator. She will give some opening remarks and then our two panelists will present. After their presentation, we'll have a roundtable discussion followed by time to answer audience questions. Please submit your questions throughout the webinar in Zoom's Q&A box, not in the chat. The chat is welcome or is open, so you're welcome to use it to engage with one another and to post observations, but please post your questions in the Q&A box so that we can track them a little bit easier. And you can also post your questions as soon as you think of them. There's no need to wait until the end of the webinar. And with that, let's begin. I'm now going to introduce our moderator, Corinne Bell. Corinne Bell is a senior attorney in NRDC's People and Communities Program. Corey focuses on drinking water and surface water pollution in several states, as well as the water-related impacts of climate change. Corey's work includes PFAS and lead contamination, environmental rights, urban runoff, and green infrastructure. Before joining NRDC, Corey worked as a staff attorney at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. She's a graduate of the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University, the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and Drexel University. She's based in NRDC's Santa Monica office. And so I'll hand things over to you, Corey. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for being here. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for that introduction, Madison. Um, and I'm excited to introduce you all to our excellent panelists today. Camille Penu and Peggy Sanner. But first, I do want to give a little bit of a roadmap. Peggy is first going to talk to us about the history of water pollution laws, starting with the Rivers and Harbors Act to the Clean Water Act. Then Camille will present on the regulatory framework for limiting water pollution in the United States. After that, Peggy is going to take us through how the Clean Water Act regulates both point and non-point sources of pollution. And then we'll finish up with the three of us discussing what is covered by Waters of the United States, which is a pretty hot topic lately. And uh, like Madison said, I'm going to keep an eye on the questions that are coming in in the Q&A session. And if there are any quick clarifying questions, I'll ask them to the panelists at the end of that section. Otherwise, I'm going to hold them until the end of the presentations. 
And yes, this is being recorded. So if you have to step away for a little bit, you can come back and uh, hear what you may have missed out on. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Camille Penu. Camille joined Columbia Law as an associate clinical professor last year. Camille founded and directs the Just Transition Clinic there, which focuses on addressing the disproportionate impacts of climate change on low-income communities of color, with particular attention to workers and shifting to more sustainable production. Before joining the Columbia Law faculty, Camille taught law clinics at UC Irvine and UC Davis. At the latter, she founded the AOP Water Justice Clinic, which focused on providing safe and affordable water to low-income rural communities. Camille was also an Equal Justice Works Fellow and a clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut. She received both her undergraduate and law degrees from UC Berkeley. Peggy Sanner is going to start us off today, and Peggy has been with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation since 2010, ser serving first as CBF's Virginia staff attorney and since 2020 as the executive director of the foundation's Virginia office, where she oversees 25 employees who work throughout the state. Prior to 2010, Peggy worked as a litigator at several law firms. Peggy leads the foundation's efforts to use science, law, and advocacy to restore the Chesapeake Bay through implementation of the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint, a total maximum daily load pollution reduction plan that you'll learn a little bit more about today, that was developed by the seven Bay jurisdictions and EPA. Peggy guides CBF's legal and advocacy work in Virginia, which includes working with the Virginia administration, members of the Virginia General Assembly, environmental agencies, and numerous environmental partners. Peggy received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Swarthmore College, a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, and her law degree from Rutgers University. And with that, I will now turn it over to Peggy to give us an overview of water pollution control laws in the United States. Oh, I think you're muted, Peggy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk about really the foundation of uh, the work that we do at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, and the foundation of uh, clean water efforts throughout the United States. It, it makes sense to start off a little bit uh, before the Clean Water Act, however, uh, to think about the background and influences it may have uh, on uh, where we are today. And to do that, I wanted to uh, bring to your attention uh, a case that was brought in Virginia in the first half, half of the 20th century, brought by a landowner, Old Dominion Land Company, against a county. The, the circumstance was that that landowner had been held in violation of the county's zoning laws because he dumped raw sewage into a tidal river nearby. Um, the landowner was not happy about that and took the matter to ultimately to the state Supreme Court. The court ruled with the landowner saying, first of all, um, tidal waters are not something that the county has any control over. That's the jurisdiction of the state. But more important, the very function of streams and rivers, and indeed the ocean, the natural office, it said, uh, is to carry off the impurities and the off-scourings of the land, getting, getting rid of them so that the people can do what they want to do. So pretty striking opinion, at least uh, insofar as uh, looking back on it uh, almost um, 70 years later, it's concerned, but it wasn't alone. Uh, that was not a single opinion. That is a perspective that uh, held sway across the country in a variety of different contexts from the state's level. Uh, it was also um, in the background uh, to early efforts by the federal government to uh, take care of uh, interstate waters. Um, the first uh, action that we've seen by Congress um, is the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, a law still in force. Uh, and though it did include some quasi-environmental protections, largely it was directed to ensuring that waterways, interstate waterways, did not have refuse dumped in it in a manner that would uh, hinder or impair uh, commerce on those waterways. 
Um, and so um, there was a permitting um, process uh, in place uh, if someone disposed of refuse in the waterways without securing a permit. There was uh, no direct um, uh, effect on uh, pollution dis um, dumping per se. So um, some 50 years passed during which various efforts were made to update that law, uh, but they did not really uh, come to fruition on a federal legislative level until 1948 when um, Congress was able to pass what became known as the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948. Uh, as you would imagine by its title, it, this one was focused at least to some extent on controlling pollution, but it was quite limited. Uh, it applied only to interstate waters, not to any waterway that was entirely bounded within state uh, borders. It allowed the federal government to you know, give assistance to the states, maybe to uh, provide some help in research related to uh, treatment facilities, uh, but the states really retained most authority. And you can see that in its very cumbersome enforcement mechanism. Really, the only enforcement mechanism that uh, was included of any note is that if a downstream effect on health, a negative health effect was asserted, the U.S. Surgeon General was theoretically empowered to bring an abatement action to stop that pollution, but only after some very cumbersome procedures and with the consent of the state where the pollution activity arose. That was so cumbersome and so awkward that, in fact, no enforcement efforts were undertaken for 20 years. Uh, and so uh, we reached, frankly, the middle of the 20th century with more than 100 years of industrial activity along our waterways, um, development activities that uh, lined the waterways with cities, towns, and other um, uh, development um, building activities. And you could see uh, the direct results of the historic uh, treatment of our waterways, primarily as conduits to get rid of uh, pollution or to facilitate commerce. We saw that in effects on our fish and wildlife. Uh, I've noted here a $3 million loss in 1969 dollars. That's huge to the fishing industry in the Chesapeake Bay, one of the historically richest fisheries in the nation. Uh, we saw the largest recorded fish kill in uh, a lake in Florida, 26 million fish. Uh, these, those were not isolated instances. We had human health effects, bacteria levels in rivers. Look at the one for Hudson River, 170 times what was considered the, the safe limit. 30% of drinking water in the United States exceeded public health standards for chemical contaminants, and an estimated two-thirds of the nation's waterways were unfit for swimming or fishing. Obviously, a terrible situation uh, that could only be tolerated to the extent people turned their back to waterways. Uh, but then, in that year, 1969, we had an event which many of you may have heard of, uh, which was a major fire on the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, it's important to note this wasn't the only fire that uh, was ignited from the chemicals in the Cuyahoga River. There were at least a dozen or so preceding that on that river. Uh, there were fires on other rivers across the country. It was not an uncommon occurrence but it was a striking occurrence. And let's see if we can move ahead here. Um, it was an occurrence that caught the horror and if you will, the imagination of um, our, some very important media outlets in that era, certainly the local press, Time Magazine. Uh, and you can see the images that the nation was treated to, which were uh, in a word, horrifying both in terms of the actual, if you will, sludge in the river to the uh, explosion type of fire that we saw in that picture. It was shocking to the nation. 
And uh, it generated an enormous public uh, awareness and galvanized action. It is no mistake that uh, it was the following year, 1970, uh, when we saw the first uh, Earth Day uh, across the nation. It's also no uh, accident that shortly thereafter, shortly that is in con congressional terms, uh, that we saw the major uh, proposed amendments to the Federal uh, Water Pollution Control Act, which were uh, enacted into law uh, in 1972. Uh, the law as amended uh, was a, a, a mere, what it shared with its um, predecessor of the same name uh, is in fact the name. It overhauled uh, the uh, framework uh, in a dramatic way as Camille will describe in great detail. But first I want to mention, this was a bipartisan mandate. Uh, it was passed by both houses of Congress on a bipartisan way. Uh, the then president, Richard Nixon, vetoed it. And in a stunning development, that veto was overridden in massive numbers uh, by both parties, both houses. A remarkable statement of a unified national purpose. Uh, let's see if I can get. So um, I just wanted to spend a minute or two on. Uh, how that act articulated uh, the national purpose. Um, it purported to, in a specific way, uh, schedule the elimination of toxic pollutants. Uh, it talked about the different kinds of pollution that would be regulated, and we'll get into more of that later, point sources and non-point point sources. Uh, but it stated a policy uh, that was important uh, for the development of and ultimately the passage of the act. And that is, it did not trample on, but it supplemented uh, the historic rights of the states to prevent, reduce, and eliminate pollution. Federal agencies were tasked with um, cooperating with the state. And that was a key part of helping it to pass. So I'll now uh, be delighted to pass the baton uh, to my colleague, Camille Panu. Thank you. Sorry, one sec. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the nitty gritty of the Clean Water Act. Uh, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the slide movement. There we go. All right, now we're cooking with fire. Um, so to take a step back, it helps to know kind of where the um, Clean Water Act gets its authority from because it kind of helps set up what we'll talk about a little bit later in this session on the waters of the United States. Um, but I wanted to kind of set up this geographic scope a little bit. So the mandate of the Clean Water Act is written fairly broadly, and that's intentional. As Peggy said, there was really powerful bipartisan support for the Clean Water Act and for its subsequent amendments. Um, and so part of that was to ensure that it wasn't just the navigable waters of the United States that were protected from pollution, um, and that the navigable waters ends up being a term of art. Um, but it was also important that we think about water systems as connected. So a lake doesn't exist on its own, right? A river doesn't exist on its own. Anyone who has exposure to water systems understands that there's watersheds, there's interactions between wetlands and streams and creeks and other tributaries, there's runoff. So the built environment and the natural environment are complex and are not limited. You can't separate a river from all of the different tributary streams that go to the river. Um, and because the federal government understood that, um, the Clean Water Act tries to focus uh, very directly on how to manage the flow of those kinds of um, potential sources of pollution 
into water. And pollu pollutants can be written kind of large. Originally, we were thinking about, or when the Clean Water Act was passed, there was a, a great focus on industrial pollutants in particular. But examples, other common examples of pollutants can be, um, you know, raw sewage that's like dumped out into the water. That was kind of common at the time. Um, it can also include runoff from um, stormwater surge or, or from stormwater um, kind of flowing out into, into gutters. Um, and it can also include things that we might not think of intuitively, like changing the temperature of the water. So it's not just uh, chemical pollutants. There's a pretty wide array of things that can be considered a pollutant into the water. Um, the reason that we focus on these navigable waters is because the federal authority for uh, regulating pollution and regulating um, the quality of our nation's waters comes from what's called the Commerce Clause within the Constitution. Um, the Commerce Clause is how Congress does a lot of its regulatory work, um, and so that becomes really important. It's based on the idea that Congress has the right to regulate interstate commerce, meaning any kind of trade or activity um, that's related to economic um, processes, and that that can include um, maintenance of waterways. Um, and the, this term, waters of the United States and navigable waters, uh, which we'll talk about at length, comes up pretty in depth um, throughout the Clean Water Act and throughout its implementation. But that is the framework for the geographic scope. So the Clean Water Act um, interceded in part because we weren't getting the same level of regulation that we needed at the state level. And also because anything that's an interstate water system is going to be difficult to manage, especially when you have states that are a water system that spans states that are politically very disparate. And so the federal government created um, a series of permitting systems and um, different permission systems to deal with different elements of the Clean Water Act. So the uh, system that we'll talk about the most is the national pollution discharge elimination um, system program or the MPDES permit. Um, these are permits that are given to point sources, which uh, Peggy will talk about in a little bit, but they are essentially concrete sources of water pollution. We know that this thing is going to be releasing things um, that will pollute the water on an ongoing basis. And so we are going to ask you to get a permit. Um, the permit is going to do things like set the total maximum daily load, which is another term of art. So what is the most that this ecosystem and this water system can handle of an, any given pollutant? Um, and so the permitting system is trying to help balance the inflow of different kinds of pollutants into our waters. Um, it imposes certain technology standards, uh, depending on what kind of pollution it is, um, and asks essentially the polluter to be responsible for a portion of ensuring that uh, certain pollutants are not released at all and that other pollutants are treated before they're released into the water. Um, and the way that, it, that this works is through a pretty complex system of um, what we call cooperative federalism. So here we go. So um, the way that this works, and this is true also in the drinking water context, is that the federal government sets the standards based on science, best available science at the time. And so there's this iterative process where the EPA and other regulatory agencies um, are working together to generate as much public health and um, scientific data as possible to help support figuring out what each water system can, um, can survive or sustain. And they set the standards and then they delegate the authority to tribal governments and to the states to issue the permits. So different states have dis different issuing agencies. So for example, if we go to the previous slide, um, uh, in Virginia, this is the, the Department of Environmental Quality. And then Peggy, what's DCR? The Department of? Conservation and Recreation. Conservation and Recreation, there we go. Um, in California, this is the State Water Resources Control Board, which is a very long name. Um, in, in New York, this is the Department of Environmental um, Conservation. So each state has a, an agency and is supposed to um, designate an agency that is in charge of managing the permitting system. So they're accepting the applications, issuing the permits, and ensuring that folks are in compliance with these federal standards. <clears throat> Um, it's important to note that, <clears throat> excuse me, the Clean Water Act really contemplated that states um, should retain their ability to 
manage their water systems as well. Um, so it sets kind of the what I would call the floor. So it's a federal floor on here's what we need at a bare minimum for our water systems to be healthy. States can then go above and beyond. And there are about, I think we were going to say in the context of wetlands, there's 19 states, is that right? That also have additional protections that they've adopted at the state level that go beyond the federal protections. Um, and those work together um, to ensure that there's uh, adequate protection. And the Clean Water Act says explicitly that you know, the, the act does not supersede or preempt state regulation of its own um, standards if those standards are above what the Clean Water Act provides. So you can't go below, but you can go above. <clears throat> and so in order to help facilitate this, um, the Clean Water Act contemplates that states will implement the program. Um, the federal government provides some funding in what is now called um, revolving funds, so state revolving funds, which are a partnership between um, the state and each state and federal governments to create essentially a pot of money that people can apply to, to try to build uh, projects or to try to implement systems that will decrease water pollution, particularly from uh, sewage and stormwater um, systems, but the Clean Water Act covers more than that. Um, there's a number of grant programs as well to states. And uh, you know, the Clean Water Act kind of sets a standard for water quality standards, and then also asks states to be involved in ranking how impaired each of their water systems is, meaning how far are you from your ecosystem being healthy? What's your most at risk system? Um, so for example, I live now in New York City. For the longest time, the Gowanus Canal was very high on that list. The Hudson River was high on the, the list as well. So which water systems are impaired and require some kind of remediation and help can vary from state to state. Um, and the Clean Water Act allows each state to essentially set its goals for what its highest priority water systems are um, while requiring all of, all of this process to kind of come up. States come up with plans for how they'll address this and then um, the federal government or the EPA approves that plan. And that's very similar to how we regulate air pollution as well, for example. So, um, keep going. So we talked about cooperative federalism. This is the idea that the state and the federal government are partners um, and that there can be overlapping uh, regulatory systems, but that they're working together to meet the needs of, of whatever the local conditions are. There's this idea that there's innovation when you allow states to have that kind of flexibility. So we don't have the federal government mandating and then being so rigid that states can't be creative with how they try to get programs off the ground or what they pilot. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Peggy to talk about point sources versus non-point sources, which as, um, as I mentioned, are really important in the context of the uh, distribution and per permitting system that happens through the MPDES system. So, um I just wanted to uh, state at the outset uh, one characteristic of um, lawmaking, and in particular federal lawmaking of complicated programs like the Clean Water Act. Uh, you have to kind of figure out what they're talking about. You need to look at all the definitions. And um, the definition of, um, that, that I wanna start off with is uh, point sources. Um, Camille has uh, identified um, uh, point sources as one of the group of uh, sources of pollution that the Clean Water Act addresses. Uh, and so what is it? Well, it is classically a pipe from which really nasty industrial stuff or wastewater stuff uh, is poured out into a local waterway. That's what most people think of as the classic point source. But in fact, it also includes a whole lot of other things, ditches, channels, conduits, wells, discrete fissures, rolling stock, vessels, floating craft, uh, combined animal feeding operations, and many more. And you can see uh, in this slide two examples, even the one on the left, you may not think about that as a pipe, but you see the uh, ditch, which is uh, pouring water into a larger ditch, potentially an irrigation uh, ditch, um, and that is considered to be a point source. 
um, moving this to the next slide. Um, here are two industrial facilities that I want to, that allow us to talk about uh, two different kinds of point sources under the Clean Water Act framework. Um, there is the actual physical structure of a, an industrial facility, whether it's a wastewater treatment plant or another chemical uh, producing, uh, you know, potentially a chemical producing operation. Those uh, facilities may have pipes that discharge to local waterways. Those are plainly point sources. But you'll notice here, as we all know, these facilities sit on lands and they sit on land uh, which receives rain and that rain can wash over the surface of uh, the water, picking up pollutants, maybe dirt, maybe particles that come from uh, the air that's been um, subjected to, uh, for example, some air emissions. So it could be there are chemicals in that stormwater. So EPA uh, regulates uh, industrial facilities, not just with the pipe uh, leading with, that leads out, that releases um, fluid discharges, but also stormwater discharges from industrial facilities. Here are more examples of industrial facilities that have been deemed to fall within uh, the category of point sources. You see in the left, this is a tunnel that connects uh, wastewater uh, from the city of New York filled with uh, sediments, uh, you can see by the color, uh, with a, um, a waterway. Uh, and uh, the city first challenged uh, a, a, an enforcement action. They said the city had failed to get a Clean Water Act permit, a, a National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit, and therefore was in violation and the court held that it, there was a violation because this tunnel was a point source and it needed to be permitted. Another example, a, a fairly well-known case, the National Cotton Council versus EPA, what was at issue there was a, uh, an, a, a system which sprayed pesticides on agricultural lands uh, with some of the spray uh, ultimately landing into uh, what looks to be here, an irrigation ditch then connected to a waterway. The court, the court held that that was indeed a point source and needed to be um, uh, permitted under the, um, uh, the National Pollution Elimination, Dis Elimination, Discharge Elimination System permit. I'll call that a NIPTES permit here on out by way of habit. Um, another one here, this is a coal loading conveyor uh, which was under scrutiny uh, by the appellate, the federal appellate court uh, in the western part of the nation, the Ninth Circuit. Um, that coal conveyor uh, uh, carried coal, of course, and some of which uh, ended up in the waterway. It was a point source, according to the court. Uh, another important uh, kind of point source uh, for um, land disturbing activities, land disturbing activities that disturb at least an acre or when such activities were part of a common plan of development that as taken as a whole would be at least an acre in size. And so there was a permit that that's required um, for these construction activities to make sure that they were designed in such a way that once the permitting, uh, once the construction was done, the runoff would be as clean as possible. So that's also a, a um, point source. As many of you know, uh, one of the largest um, sources of uh, food in this country uh, is um, our uh, industrial agricultural operations. Uh, poultry, uh, this looks to be turkeys, I think, maybe chickens, uh, livestock in the top right, uh, and swine in the bottom right. All of those, depending upon their size, if they reach a certain size, they are classified as confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs as we know them. These CAFOs produce, uh, can produce vast quantities of manure, which is then used as fertilizer on row crop operations. 
uh, and uh, permits are required for uh, those operations to ensure that uh, the runoff uh, from uh, these uh, fertilized, um, the manure fertilized spheres are properly handled. Here's a, a one that honestly uh, is pretty interesting um, and a relatively recent uh, development. Uh, discharges to groundwater. Under what circumstances can a discharge not to service water, but to groundwater be considered a point source? This arose in Hawaii. Um, the county of Maui uh, uh, sued, uh, sorry, reverse. Uh, ultimately, the Hawaii Wildlife Fund sued the county alleging that its system of uh, disposing of partially treated wastewater um, was a point source and needed to be permitted because the a plaintiff said uh, coral reefs were being hurt by a discharge. And so as the court evaluated it, and ultimately this went to the Supreme Court, court studied what that process was uh, so we had uh, partially treated wastewater that was injected into the groundwater by a series of injection wells that you can see in this slide. In deep in the groundwater, uh, that wastewater mixed with other freshwater and seawater that was found there naturally. And in a combined way, this uh, groundwater now contaminated with uh, material from the wastewater um, injection uh, reach the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the court found um, in what was a welcome decision by many of us who care about our waterways, uh, that this was a system that, sh that was the functional equivalent of a point source because there was a conveyance that well, and uh, that led to the discharge of pollutants to uh, surface waters in a way that um, made sense to the court. Now, the court didn't say only this kind of injection system to the groundwater would be considered a point source. There are other situations where facilities do discharge um, a variety of kinds of wastewater to the groundwater and have claimed or are claiming to also be covered under this exception. We see here pictures of a coal ash pond facility in um, the Midwest, uh, this is a, a, a pond where an energy, a coal-fired energy um, generation facility has coal ash as a waste uh, and stored in ponds uh, for a while, ultimately before dewatering and disposal. Um, but the, the liquid in the pond is filled with chemicals like arsenic, boron, selenium, all of which are deleterious chemicals. Uh, and which uh, can be found, uh, certainly were alleged to be found in this case. Uh, and we know of other cases where the courts have found that those chemicals reach the, storm, the surface water via this groundwater system. So certainly will raise the question whether or not they will be considered point sources. Okay, I have talked about a variety of uh, point sources. There's, there are several, there's many others that we could can talk about. But you see, uh, it's a very large um, world of facilities and operations that require a federally authorized permit, the NIPTES permit, to control pollution uh, discharges. But that's not all. We have the world of non-point sources. Uh, and uh, in effect, these are any source of water pollution that does not meet the legal definition of point source. Uh, again, uh, pretty, pretty broad, not too many boundaries there, but two non-point sources are um, the ones that receive most and very deserved attention. Uh, one is agricultural operations, leaving aside the animal operations I mentioned a moment ago, uh, but also most stormwater runoff. Uh, and um, they are, the Clean Water Act mentions them uh, and notes that it is, the, again, the national policy that programs to develop and uh, programs should be developed to control and reduce pollution 
from these sources as well as point sources. So um, again, uh, we, we have to think about how what the states are doing, hopefully with and often with the assistance of the federal government through the grant programs uh, and other programs that uh, Camille mentioned. So um, how are the states doing? Uh, I would say the answer is mixed. Um, and, and I'll just uh, shine a light for a moment on uh, agriculture. Uh, probably many of you in this audience uh, come from uh, families who do agricultural work or know people who do agricultural work. Um, a really important segment of the economy and uh, frankly, our ability to survive as a nation, as a, as a race. Farmers are typically, um, we have found in our work, very conscious of their stewardship obligations. They care about the land, they care about the water. And so state programs addressing agriculture by and large are voluntary in nature. Farmers can sign up if they want. Um, they can and do consist to, to a great extent of programs to provide money, either a percentage or a, uh, in some cases, all the cost of putting up practices on the ground that uh, stem um, or are hoped to stem the runoff of polluted water from agricultural fields. And these can be a wide range. I mean, in Virginia, more than 100, but they include fencing cattle out of streams to keep their feces on the land and useful for fertilizer purposes, planting riparian forested buffers, um, applying, uh, planting cover crops so that you don't have a bare exposed soil for many seasons of the year, uh, you putting, um, the, the, the list goes on and on. What is characteristic of these programs to the present, however, is they focus on practices, and not on measured outcomes. And so these practices in, in, in effect are very different from the point source practices uh, that are directed by the Clean Water Act. Agricultural uh, programs um, that are directed by the states very rarely uh, include any uh, requirements, any mandates. I will just give you one example of one that we're familiar with in Virginia, there is, um, some legislation that requires uh, farm operations with a cattle of a certain size to fence cattle out of streams with an effective date of several years in the future. And I will just say uh, that date has just been postponed uh, for a variety of reasons. And I'm aware of another state, Pennsylvania, which has a specific law on the books, which prohibits localities, municipalities, from requiring cattle to be fenced out of streams. So uh, we have lots of experimentation going on, lots of efforts, um, uh, but uh, we haven't um, made the same kind of progress as on the nine points on the point source side. Uh, unregulated stormwater. Uh, think about this. Think about uh, a suburban community, anyone that you might think of, where rain hits the roof. Uh, goes from the roof to the driveway, to the street, or to the sidewalk. It picks up temperature, it picks up speed, it picks up pollution, goes into our waterways. That is, largely speaking, unregulated stormwater, meaning very few controls. Um, there's one exception. Municipal systems to collect stormwater usually are under a point source uh, permit. Um, but it's very difficult to control or to reduce pollution from uh, unregulated stormwater. So now that you know all there is to know about point sources and non-point sources, um, the question arises, what happens? Uh, how do these uh, programs work together? Um, Camille mentioned that states are required under the Clean Water Act to identify all of their impaired streams, all of the waterways that do not meet water quality standards that are polluted. Um, and so for each of those streams, the state is obligated to develop this terribly cumbersome term, total maximum daily load, we call it a blueprint. Uh, this blueprint is to be created for each 
pollutant that makes a waterway impaired. So it might be for nitrogen, it might be for phosphorus, it might be for sediment. You have a different TMDL uh, uh, for each of those. And the idea is that it identifies what comes from the point sources, what comes from non-point sources, assigns responsibility to point sources and to non-point sources to do things to reduce that pollution so that ideally in the end, the reductions are such that the water is returned to water quality standards. So uh, that is the theory. Just a little diagram to show the elements of this. The state adopts the water quality standard. The state then monitors and assesses those waterways uh, to see which ones are polluted or impaired. Uh, they go on a list. EPA looks at the list, says it is or it isn't okay. If it is okay, the state is then charged to develop one of these TMDLs uh, that takes into account point source pollution, non-point source pollution, and adds a little bit of an extra uh, piece just to make sure that everything is uh, taken into account. So theoretically, that is how we are taking account of what comes out of um, point sources and what comes off of the land and non-point sources, and we're going to end up with clean water. Um, there are problems associated with this uh, system. I'm sure you're not surprised at that. Um, there are TMDLs or, or blueprints that states across the country have been developing, hundreds of them, probably thousands of them. Um, to my knowledge, uh, Virtually all of them address, not, not all, but many of them, most of them address a single stream at a time or a stream segment even, a, P, a part of the Potomac River, for example. Um, they largely do not have a deadline for any of these activities. Uh, they take a long time to develop and the enforcement mechanisms, particularly on the non-point side, are pretty limited if they exist at all. And so the examples of success, a successful completion of returning a waterway to a restored condition um, are very, very welcome. Uh, and they're certainly not as numerous as we would all hope. Uh, I just wanted to uh, turn your attention for a minute or two to a, a regional TMDL that we've been working on for a number of years and that addresses the Chesapeake Bay as a whole. As Camille mentioned, there's seven uh, jurisdictions, um, seven, six states in the Washington DC area. Um, those seven jurisdictions partnered with the EPA uh, to develop a new TMDL to address the whole region. And they did that after years of efforts, singly and in, in collaborative efforts that did not work. So they agreed to uh, put together this TMDL that's it addressed three pollutants, nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and sediment. And it told each state, each one had to reduce its uh, levels of pollution to the Bay by a certain percentage. States had to, to develop plans to achieve that goal. There were milestones involved. There, was, there were deadlines, one of them, the big one coming right up in 2025. And there were some uh, consequences uh, if uh, the, the goals are not achieved. And I would say we have uh, now, as we're nearing 2025, uh, uh, some great successes uh, from this program, particularly on the land uh, side. I need to skip ahead here. Um, this is one of many uh, charts, uh, graphs that you can see that point out both its successes and its uh, big challenges. The large light blue um, block in each column is agriculture. In other words, the chunk of the pollution load to the bay that comes from agriculture. And the yellow is the chunk of pollution to the bay coming from all the wastewater facilities. And if you look at the middle bar, that's uh, 2009 when our program basically started. And uh, on the right-hand column is 2021. If you look closely, you can see that 
uh, the block representing wastewater diminished considerably. Uh, and that's certainly an accurate representation of what we have seen. We see some really, I mean, the Potomac River, for example, um, was kind of like the Cuyahoga River uh, when uh, some of this process started. And it's, uh, it's a, seeing a remarkable renaissance right now. The blue area, very stubborn. Uh, it uh, continues to uh, provide a very large chunk of the pollution. Lest you be uh, disheartened by this, uh, keep in mind that the region at issue, the 64,000 mile um, population of uh, the uh, 64,000 square mile area of the Bay has uh, seen a dramatic increase in population in the same time frame, And we have not increased pollution from our agricultural section. So there's success, just not as fast as we would like. Um, and I just, one last point that I mentioned before I turn this back over to Camille, and that is, um, it is helpful, I think, to all of us working in the environmental area that um, this particular regional uh, TMDL was upheld by uh, the federal courts uh, as being consistent with law and well within the authority uh, granted to a uh, VPA to um, participate in. So uh, I'll leave it uh, at that and hand it back over to Camille. Thank you. I was on mute. Um, thank you. So we're going to keep rolling. There we go. So um, there was a question a little bit on the chat on this where it asked if navigable waters also covers, oh, it advanced without me wanting it to. Here we go. Navigable waters, um, or if the Clean Water Act covers waters that are not navigable, I guess is a better way to frame it. And so the answer is yes-ish. Um, this is a bit of a moving target because of the Sackett case that just came down, but I thought that this um, this visual is, is very helpful. This is specifically about the Section 404 program, um, which is generally for the Army Corps of Engineers. So EPA um, has kind of lead authority or is the lead agency on things like TMDLs, the MPDES permit system, et cetera. Um, but another critical part of the Clean Water Act is focused on infill and dredging. So are you sucking stuff up from the bottom of um, a water body or are you infilling by like putting rocks and other kind of dirt into an area or perhaps other items? And so this is how the act there's a visualization of how the act talks about jurisdiction over waters. So um, generally the Clean Water Act, in addition to covering navigable waters, also covers coastal wetlands. Um, it, it goes up to the high water line, the ordinary high water line and the average high tide water line. Um, and it includes tidelands for sure. Um, if you are inland and you are not navigable, you might be covered under the Clean Water Act if you are part of a navigable water system. So County of Maui, I think, was actually a really good example of that, right? You had um, discharges to groundwater, but and groundwater is by definition not navigable. You cannot like run a canoe down a groundwater system, but it was connecting with a navigable water source that was part of uh, the waters of the United States. So waters of the United States has been interpreted um, to include water systems in a very different way than just navigable waters. Um, the reason that folks use navigable waters in the act and talk about that is because um, of the authority under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So they're kind of calling back or signaling to a line of cases that has talked about specifically federal authority over navigable waters. But as a practical matter, the courts have understood and Congress has established that um, when we have these water systems with tributaries, like you can be in a stream or a creek, which you can't necessarily like Put a boat on necessarily um, depending on its size but it could still be a waterway that is subject to clean water act um, regulation particularly if it's going to fill into a navigable navigable waterway if it doesn't have that connection to a navigable waterway at the like end of this process um, then it generally is not covered by the clean water act unless there's some other kind of explanation 
So as you can imagine, that requires a little bit of scientific work as well to kind of set up what the hydrology systems are for each of these different waterways that are protected and how that works. So this becomes important because wetlands, which exist both on the coast and inland, um, are critical for the environment and are explicitly covered and explicitly mentioned several times in the Clean Water Act, both in terms of regional programs, but also in terms of the state's ability, um, the state meaning like state government's ability to work with the federal government on these infill issues and other issues that might require special permitting. Um, wetlands are always kind of popular for development reasons. Um, <clears throat> depending on where you've located, that could be because there's offshore drilling opportunities for oil. It could be an effort to expand or extend land so that it can be developed for like commercial or residential enterprises. Um, a lot of parts of the country infilled their wetlands um, prior to the Clean Water Act being put into place. And so this was an active effort to preserve our wetlands, which are really critical ecosystems that also are um, essential for flood control and water quality management in addition to the biodiversity that they provide. So waters of the United States or WOTUS. Um, Technically, the phrase is relatively broad in the statute, which usually means that the agencies that are in charge of applying or implementing the statute get first shot at defining what that means. So EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers um, worked collectively to define WOTUS. There was, there's been some back and forth. So they, you know, there was a WOTUS rule that came out under the Obama administration. It was not finalized. And then the Trump administration tried to redo it um, and scale it way back. And then the Biden administration came in and reestablished the broader uh, definition. And then we had Sackett. So when we talk about waterways, I think one of the things, I'm gonna tee this up so we can talk about Sackett in a little bit, but one of the things to keep in mind is how we think about water in the East versus the West. So for the most part on the East Coast, rivers don't go dry, rivers, consistently flow. They may be diverted, they may have canals, they may have other infrastructure built on them, but areas that are wet and lakes that are wet tend to remain wet. Um, that has changed recently with climate change. We saw like historic droughts in areas that are considered to be his historically very wet, including parts of New York, the Great Lake states, um, etc. But historically prior to like kind of the climate change moment we're seeing right now, um, the East has been wet. And the West is very dry. So once you cross the Mississippi, um, groundwater becomes really critical, but also surface water becomes less reliable. So I wanted to show a couple of images to talk about, to show examples of um, waters of the United States that might not occur to us as waters of the United States. So, um, so this is a photo from the Army Corps of Engineers. And so my question is, is this a river? So um, you may have seen this before. This is the Los Angeles River, which has been lined in concrete. Uh, Hollywood actors have filmed scenes there. Um, and it's very rare to see water flowing through the river anymore. There's a multi-year restoration project going, but um, this was a river that flowed naturally. And it no longer, like you can't put a boat on the water ponds that you're seeing or the puddles you're seeing here in the like concrete bed. However, if you talk to any Californian, certainly any Angelino, they would tell you that's a river. Um, and they would tell you that it's an interstate river um, or connected to an interstate river system. And thus is part of the waters of the United States. And it is, it's subject to the Clean Water Act and what we do with it, whether we fill it in or we don't fill it in, et cetera, whether we restore it um, is covered by the Clean Water Act. But I think it's really interesting because it's really typical of the West where you can have a river and the river might not flow. This is another example. This is also the LA River. So you can see just how shallow it is even when there is water. Um, recently it's been flowing. I saw a video that showed like water in the LA River and I was shocked. I've lived in California for over 35 years and uh, I had never seen water flow in the river before. Um, so my question with this photo is, is this a creek? So this is an arroyo, which is a um, Spanish word for a wash or a floodplain. Um, it specifically refers to tributary creeks um, that are often dry. And then you'll have moments of flash flooding because um, they're out in the desert. And the flash flooding happens when there's rain. 
if you ask any person who lives in this region, they will tell you this is a creek, even though you can't see water. And they would say that it should be protected by the Clean Water Act. And this is another example. This is from Arizona. Um, this is another arroyo. You can't, unless you know what you're looking for, you might not even see the bed where it flows. But this is a tributary river um, or stream to the Colorado River system. And so, again, you know, uh, it's important for us to consider where the Clean Water Act is being applied and how it's being applied and how we think of water flowing. Um, certainly, if you have water coming through the arroyo, which you will, it, as you can see from the storm clouds, it's about to flood any moment. Um, once you start getting water flowing and flowing into these um, western water systems in particular, uh, there's going, it's important for us to think about what's being put in the arroyo and how the arroyo is being used uh, because it absolutely affects the water quality of the Colorado River or for the other major rivers that flow out of that system. And in the Southwest, um, a lot of surface water looks like this. There are lakes that go dry and then, you know, they come back. So, you know, query whether that's a navigable water. Until Sackett, um, there was no real kind of majority opinion in the Supreme Court. And so states were, were kind of filling in the blanks and regulating a lot of this. Um, some of them will continue to regulate it, but I think there's going to be some fighting over whether the Clean Water Act um, covers these kind of quote unquote dry rivers or dry streams that are intermittent or that come in when there's major uh, water events. But I would argue that the ecosystem of the desert is different than the ecosystem of um, the, the East where it's much more lush and much more wet. All right, so I'm going to turn it back to Peggy to talk about, or to Corey, I think, to talk about Sackett first. Um, Corey, do you want me to go back a slide? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say that as someone who worked on LA River issues for several years, it is a true river and you can kayak on it at times. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've been talking a little bit about Sackett today, um, and I'm going to give some background on that. And the, this case addresses exactly what Camille was just talking about, you know, what is covered as a water of the United States. And unfortunately, the decision in Sackett versus EPA drastically reduces the number of wetlands that are protected by the Clean Water Act. And just for a little background on why wetlands are important and should be protected to begin with, um, wetlands themselves filter out pollution and help reduce pollution in water bodies. They're a critical habitat and they act as nurseries for all kinds of critters. And wetlands also recharge groundwater supplies and are critical to reducing the, the effects of climate change. Because they absorb floodwaters, they protect against erosion and sedimentation, and they also store carbon. So they're a tremendous resource when it comes to climate change problems. In Sackett, the court ruled that wetlands are not waters covered by the Clean Water Act unless they touch and are indistinguishable from other covered waters, things like lakes, rivers, or streams. And this is a reversal of roughly 50 years of federal protections. Um, Sackett also adopts a reading of the Clean Water Act that five justices on the court rejected in a prior case almost 20 years ago. Three justices led by Justice Kagan accused the majority in Sackett of rewriting the law to fit their policy preferences. And just to provide some more context on, on wetlands, there has been significant degradation and destruction of U.S. wetlands between the time of European colonization in the 1980s, it's estimated that we lost about 53% of the wetlands in the continental US, they were destroyed. And now with Sackett, we're estimating that at least 50% of those remaining wetlands in the lower 48 states, by our count, at least 19,000 wetlands at a minimum, are no longer protected under the Clean Water Act. So more of them are going to be destroyed. This is really an unacceptable outcome and it's not what was envisioned by the Clean Water Act with the goals that Peggy mentioned before, including ceasing water pollution. The US already loses vital wetlands at a scary clip and now we can only assume that it will get worse because of this decision. But there are some remaining options to protect wetlands. I don't wanna to be um, totally pessimistic here. 
Those include, first of all, fixing the Clean Water Act. And obviously that will take time given the current makeup of Congress and how slow everything is moving at the congressional level at the moment. It also includes advocating for increased federal funding to conserve wetlands and protect them. You can, for example, pay landowners not to develop these areas. Um, also, you can enforce existing state, tribal, and local water protections and increase funding for enforcement. And of course, you can adopt new local requirements that uh, prevent and clean up water pollution in wetlands in the first place. So these last two options are pretty interesting because like Camille mentioned, there are around 19 or so states that do have additional protections but there are also 20 states that have passed what we call no stricter than laws, which essentially prohibit the state environmental agencies from being more protective than the federal EPA. So it'll be a problem in those states to, to pass additional protections. If you're interested in learning, learning more about Sackett, ELI put together a great webinar, I think it was last week, and that's available online. Also, the uh, National Association of Wetland Managers held an in-depth webinar on the decision, so you should check out those two resources. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Peggy so she can give you some real-world examples of how she expects this decision to play out in Virginia. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will just advance this slide. There we go. Um, I, I would just note a number of the folks in chat had uh, wondered about whether or not the slides were to advance. Uh, Corey was uh, speaking without slides. So uh, if you're with us with uh, a slide titled State Protection Wetlands Post Sackett, Virginia example, you are with us. Um, I would note <clears throat> again that uh, all of the uh, comments made by Camille and Corey about the seriousness of Sackett and its effect on the protection of our wetlands uh, are um, are, are speaking the truth. Uh, and while there are some examples, Virginia being one, where we have a very comprehensive state program, uh, the majority of states do not. Uh, and even in states like Virginia, we have uh, significant concerns, which I'll go through now. So um, one way that uh, the state program uh, differs from the federal program is that there is no uh, Virginia state legislation that limits uh, regulation of waters to uh, navigable waters. Instead, we have a definition of state waters which covers everything, all bodies on the surface and under the ground, wholly or partially within the Commonwealth, including wetlands. Those are state waters and they're within the jurisdiction of our regulatory agencies uh, to protect they are subject to, frankly, an environmental or constitutional uh, provision which requires protection of these waterways. Um, <clears throat> there is a very expansive definition of wetlands themselves, uh, which I'll let you uh, read, but uh, largely anything that is inundated or saturated by surface or groundwater frequently uh, and has the right kind of vegetation. Virginia's wetlands program, I will note, stated in tidal, started in tidal areas in um, the late 70s, uh, and it was uh, expanded in the early 2000s to recover, to address uh, non-tidal wetlands. So at this point, the entire Commonwealth is covered by a wetlands program, which is administered largely through state uh, permits um, uh, which uh, had been uh, issued in conjunction with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, that, of course, will change some, somewhat moving forward. But largely speaking, under Virginia's wetlands permitting program, um, a permit is required whenever anyone wants to excavate or discharge wastes or other noxious substances into the waters. Uh, whenever any, anyone wants to alter the physical, chemical, or biological proper, properties of state waters, drain, alter, or degrade, fill, or dump, permanently flooding or impounding, all of those activities require uh, permits. 
And importantly, the permits as issued must ensure that the activity will not cause or even contribute to a significant impairment of state waters or fish and wildlife. Permits must avoid, must require the, act, the, the person seeking a permit to avoid and minimize wetland impacts. And it also requires compensation to achieve a standard which uh, is quite important and that is no net loss of existing wetland acreage and functions. A very important um, requirement, not always uh, in our view attained in practice. But even with uh, all of this statewide uh, and comprehensive program, we recognize SACIT as a threat. It is a threat because um, there already is confusion about the need for and the source of permits. Um, people who don't follow this work on a regular basis might have heard that you know, the permitting program is over. They might not know, can we still go to the core for a permit or do we always have to go to the state? Does the state even have a permitting system? A lot of confusion which will have to be addressed. A grave uh, problem, which in my view will obtain not just in Virginia, but across the, uh, across the nation is the adequacy of resources uh, to address areas which might have been covered by a federal permit under the 404 program, but which will now be uh, under the jurisdiction exclusively of the state. Um, and I, I understand that um, estimates uh, in uh, our state are that 40 new people would be required to do the kinds of preparatory work that uh, has uh, been uh, handled uh, typically by the Army Corps of Engineers. And in particular, I'm referring to wetlands delineation, the need to inspect a property before any um, uh, development activity and to determine what are the boundaries of wetlands, what are the kinds of wetlands. The Corps has done that. And in certain areas, of course, it would no longer be doing that. Uh, uh, since there will be, even in Virginia, uh, an end to uh, some uh, uh, federal jurisdiction. Um, every year since I've been involved in this work, long before Sackett, um, the, um, our uh, politicians uh, uh, re-examine uh, whether or not it's appropriate to have a state system that does more than required by federal law. And uh, we certainly would not be surprised to see some of those calls um, increase this year uh, and to uh, potentially uh, find greater uh, support. Uh, and that may be the gravest of all. And, and people who've been working in the environmental sphere for decades have been aware of the need not to um, allow for a race to the bottom, the lowest common denominator, but rather to allow states to uh, experiment and, and, and potentially to do more. And so I think in all of the states where uh, we currently have comprehensive programs, it will be important uh, that um, we defend those programs. Uh, and in states where the programs are not currently comprehensive. Um, certainly, uh, it would be a welcome development to see um, greater efforts made to expand state coverage. So uh, the challenges that uh, SACIT has created uh, uh, will hit each state across the country uh, in different ways, but in all cases, in a significant way. So that's all I'll say now for SACIT in Virginia, but I did want to uh, wrap this portion of the program up by highlighting something that many of you are probably already aware of, and that is uh, potential effects of climate change in so many aspects of our lives. Climate change will present new and serious challenges to our um, ability to live up to uh, the goals and practices of the Clean Water Act in a variety of ways. 
I'll just name a few, uh, but it's not uh, ex exclusive or comprehensive by any means. On our coastlines, sea level rise will uh, indeed threaten tidal wetlands. It will drown many of them and it will um, uh, try to uh, create new wetlands in uh, areas that are now um, agricultural lands, cities, uh, residences, a uh, very significant effect on loss of wetlands, but also on increasing uh, pollution to these waterways uh, resulting from um, the flooding and um, rise of, of the sea level. Increases in storm uh, and uh, sunny weather flooding, increases in uh, the velocity, the amount, and the timing of uh, precipitation. Uh, we've seen all the extremes uh, across the nation in the last year, uh, and it certainly hits uh, the, these trends um, affect uh, every part of the country. Uh, rising temperatures. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, we're already seeing uh, warmer water. It's a very shallow water body and warmer water uh, will have all kinds of effects on, uh, on the habitat. Uh, eelgrass, a really important underwater grass for that environment, um, uh, is uh, giving, out, giving way to other uh, grasses or no grasses at all because of, in part, increased temperatures. Um, land cover changes with differences in uh, rainfall and unpredictable uh, rainfall events, we see changes in land cover uh, that um, added to development caused changes in land cover will lead to um, uh, changes to the temperature of water quality streams, uh, excuse me, of headwater streams and many other changes. Uh, th this is just a sample. Um, States will be working very hard along with their federal partner uh, at EPA to ensure that um, we try to keep up with those changes so that the Clean Water Act maintains its position as the linchpin, the bulwark, uh, the fundamental um, building block of our states, uh, of our nation's ability to protect this clean water. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Peggy. So we are getting a lot of questions in the Q&A, um, quite a few relating to Sackett, but I wanna start with um, some of the more kind of basic Clean Water Act questions. And I will direct those to an individual panelist. And then if uh, whoever doesn't answer wants to follow up, please please do feel free. So. We have a couple of questions asking about what I would consider emerging contaminants. Um, Camille, someone is asking whether EPA has the authority under Clean Water Act to regulate microplastics and microfibers, and whether that could be done either at the wastewater treatment plant or if that could even be done at the washing machine level. Could a washing machine be a point source? So um, could you discuss a little bit about that? I can try. Um, so this is an area that the EPA has been monitoring and is concerned about. Um, microplastics are increasingly problematic and microfibers have been on their radar for a while, um, probably for as long as skinny jeans have existed as a modern creation. Um, but so the, the short answer, I think, is, is yes. Uh, the long answer is that it's a process to get a pollutant listed or to get a category created and to go through the regulatory process. So that can take quite some time. Um, with respect to washing machines, I think the answer is no. I don't think they would be regulated as point sources. But what you would regulate is discharges into whatever the pipe is. And so whoever, whether that's, that normally wouldn't be a house. It would really usually be um, often regulation at the wastewater treatment plant level, but it this is kind of a persistent tension in both the Drinking Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, which is that do we impose the cost of treating water after it's already been polluted or do we require stricter um, requirements to protect water from getting polluted to begin with um, so that we can prevent uh, 
any of the cleanup costs from kind of coming down the line. And certainly for wastewater treatment plants, um, this is true also for drinking water distribution, those tend to be publicly owned, meaning like owned by gov local governments. And so you're also kind of taxing taxpayers for a problem created often by industry. Um, so in terms, one of the things to think about though um, would be whether or not there's separate agencies that have authority to regulate washing machines. They do. So another way to kind of um, get at this is also to, to advocate on the consumer protection level that there should be certain safeguards or environmental safeguards in the creation of certain technologies. There are micro plastic and microfiber filters <clears throat> available in washing machines. They're just uh, relatively expensive and it's, they're not common. They're not mainstreamed on the market. So um, good questions, good questions. So I think they could regulate it. I think it could be difficult to regulate the sort, the actual washing machine sources of a lot of this pollution. Thank you, Peggy. Do you want to follow up with anything? Yeah, I will say that um, we see on a practical level uh, some of our um, wastewater treatment plant operators already working on uh, methods to um, detect and uh, remove some of these. Uh, contaminants, microplastics certainly is one uh, from the, the stream that they discharge. Uh, obviously, uh, much more needs to be done. And Corey mentioned um, PFAS, which is, as she said, a, an emerging contaminant, um, really big issue. Uh, and because so pervasive in part um, that uh, we'll see a lot more of that going forward. And it will be done, yes, I agree, uh, to some extent under the Clean Water Act, but through these other systems that Camille mentioned. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna direct the next emerging contaminant question to you, Peggy. And um, I'm not sure which of you might have um, experience with regulating aquaculture, but um, could you talk about how Aqua, whether it's fish or shellfish aquaculture, um, how they might be considered a point source and whether they're regulated under the Clean Water Act because of the pollution that they cause to marine environments? That's a great question. Um, they are indeed regulated if they are of a certain size uh, as a point source um, under the Clean Water Act. Um, and uh, they, the, the concept in a very general way is uh, uh, the fish are, uh, right, right now I'm talking about fish, maintained in uh, a particular area. They are fed in a particular area. And of course they, like any other living organism, organism discharge their feces in a particular area. And um, because it's so concentrated, it changes the water quality in that area and in the surrounding water. So uh, it does so in, in a, to an extent that it becomes an issue that should be, it, certainly in my view and the view of many others, uh, a regulated uh, entity, and it, and it is. Not all aquaculture is, depends apart on size. Um, in, in our part of the world, we, we are uh, seeing a lot of, and certainly in support of, um, uh, a lot of shellfish aquaculture, whether it's clams or whether it's oysters. Uh, and um, Again, a lot of it depends on the size of the operation, but many of them are outside uh, the size that uh, would require uh, permitting under the Clean Water Act. But again, it has to do with the effect of the concentration of, of um, uh, animals uh, in a particular uh, water body. Thanks, Peggy. Camille, do you have anything to follow up? All right. <laughs> So I, I do have a question for you now, Camille. Um, how, if at all, does the Clean Water Act regulate atmospheric deposition of pollutants? It generally doesn't. <laughs> uh, this can be, there are certain moments in time where you could make an argument that a specific atmospheric deposition um, of a pollutant could qualify. Um, I'll give you two examples of things that don't qualify, um, but are common. So when I lived in um, California, I worked primarily in the San Joaquin Valley, which is the most polluted air basin in the country. Um, what, there was a year where just our air quality was out of control. It was during a drought. 
And when asked about um, why we were so out of control compared to historic levels, the um, executive director for the air district said that it was because it hadn't rained. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so the, the, what he was basically arguing is that all this air pollution would be not air pollution if it rained and bonded with water particles and then became basically water pollution instead, uh, which would be totally unregulated by the Clean Water Act. Um, another good example of this is if you uh, live on the East Coast or in the Midwest and were affected by the smoke from the fires in Quebec and then got thunderstorms, which happened where I lived, um, it cleaned up the air, but it cleaned up the air because it took all of that ash and soot and particulate matter and basically washed it into storm drains. So um, atmospheric deposition is very rarely covered by the Clean Water Act. Um, I can't think of a single time off the top of my head, but I've, I'm sure there's been a, at least one instance where there was something more concentrated than something was put together. But um, but yeah, for the most part, it's not really covered. It's really thinking about things in terms of stream flows, like water into water, instead of thinking about air into water or rain just, into water. I'll, sorry, I'll just uh, build on that. Um, I agree with um, your uh, comments, but I will say that um, in constructing uh, the Chesapeake Bay TMBL, we've uh, learned that about 30% of the nitrogen that um, is a pollutant to the bay comes from air deposition. And some of that's direct, uh, it, it comes from the air deposits, if you will, directly on the surface of, of the water. But um, the other piece that uh, Camille mentioned is that when it rains, a lot of that of, of nitrogen compounds, nitrogen oxide uh, is, um, uh, track, uh, you know, captured by the raindrops uh, out onto the land, and it becomes, as Camille said, nitrogen that's added to the bay. And so, in that, in those indirect senses, they become part of the mix that are part of TMDLs. They are part of what constitutes the pollution load that a TMDL uh, is designed to address. So, only indirectly, to my knowledge, as well. But, but that's an example of how they, how they can be part of the mix. Yeah, I know that this comes up quite a bit in the microplastic and in the PFAS context too, with uh, air, air deposition of these pollutants. It's, That's right. It's something you have to consider with, with a lot of these. Um, moving on, there is a question for you, Peggy, about um, the interplay of pretreatment programs and uh, exceeding TMDLs. So this person is asking whether through the 303D program, our pretreatment programs mandated where discharges have been identified as exceeding the TMDL? So that's a really interesting uh, question. And, and I will say that um, it, this is kind of the way um, it's conceived of, and I'm not saying it always follows this pattern, but um, in a TMDL context, um, the idea is, you know, you have an impaired stream, an impaired waterway, um, the, all the pollutant sources are identified and added up. And in a theoretic way, and hopefully in a real way, the point sources uh, are each given a permit and that permit sets the level of the pollutant that that facility is allowed to discharge. And uh, in a TMDL context, that should mean that the level requires pretreatment. In other words, the facility has got to treat its effluent so that the pollutant is eliminated or at least re reduced to the level that's acceptable to the TMDL. So that's the theoretic model. It doesn't always work that way. And um, so just again, to, to talk about the, the Bay TMDL, which is on a larger frame, uh, we still have levels that are uh, in excess of, of what's required. So what is the remedy? You know, what, do, what happens after you have a TMDL that's in place, approved, theoretically it's, it's working and it doesn't uh, succeed. The remedy for a point source is what it has always been, TMDL or no, which is um, an enforcement action against the facility for exceeding its permit limits. And, and hopefully that, that enforcement action then will require 
uh, additional treatment so that going forward, the, the uh, pollution load would uh, be at the right level. Thank you for that. Camille, I'll give you an opportunity to add anything. No, okay. <laughs> I don't want anybody to be left out here. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so Peggy, there is another question that I think you covered in your presentation, but I want to ask it just in case. And this is uh, whether agricultural stormwater runoff is considered a point source. And I, I believe you answered this as being no, unless it's a CAFO. Is that correct? That's that's uh, generally correct. That's right. CAFOs are definitely at a certain number of animal units. They are definitely CAFOs. But apart from that, um, agricultural runoff is not a point source. It is a non-point source. And so it is subject, if at all, to programs that the state may impose and not under the Clean Water Act. Thank you. Well, I have a pretty specific question for you now. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so this is someone's asking whether there, if there is an administrative order of consent with EPA, and in this case with the State Department of Health, I'm guessing it is State DOH, mm -hmm. would this agreement, an administrative order of consent, would it protect against a third party lawsuit? Would it protect against a, cit a citizen suit? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I'm, so where I'm stuck on this one is standing. I don't know what you think, Corey, but, um, and the reason I'm stuck there is because I don't think it necessarily would preempt a citizen suit, but you would have had to have protested the administrative order in some way. And I think it's really hard as a third party, like generally speaking, third parties can't intervene in an administrative order um, process in that way. And so I'm just, I'm not sure there's a legal pathway or a hook, but I'm also not a Clean Water Act litigator specifically. So um, I'd be happy to come back to like to ask around and follow up with, um, with folks. But I I think the answer is it shouldn't, but as a practical matter, it might, because there might not really be an avenue to challenge it if you didn't challenge it early on, and if there's not a public process for challenging the administrative order. Yeah, I think we might need a little more detail to answer yeah. this. Peggy, do you have any ideas? Yeah, I think we just need more, more information. So feel free to drop more information in the Q&A section and I can follow up. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of questions <laughs> on Sackett, which is not surprising. Um, probably half of what we've received so far, but there's a pretty broad question that has come up in a different uh, in different questions. And it's about the interplay of the definition of a navigable water and waters of the United States and how that's tied to commerce and the Commerce Clause. And I think Camille, you had talked about that in your presentation. So could you just give a quick overview of that again? Sure, so I think, um, so the Commerce Clause is, is about one third of what you study in a constitutional law course when you're a law student. So, <laughs> and then it'll come up again and again and again, including in administrative law. So my caveat is that the, um, like the Commerce Clause is even how we have criminal federal crimes, for example. So um, I want to caveat this by saying that a lot of things are lumped under commerce that are not what you and I would traditionally think of as business or commerce. So um, commerce is kind of broadly construed. It is related to the movement of goods or people. I think that's like a fair way to think about it or the provision of services. Um, so, so I would hold that as kind of your background about how we think about the Commerce Clause. So the concept of a navigable water and its interface with the Commerce Clause and the idea of commerce um, it exists because way back in the day when we shipped goods, we shipped them on boats, basically. <laughs> um, you know, ground transportation didn't really exist. We weren't trucking things. If we were moving stuff over land, it was like in a caravan style with the horses or oxen, depending on where you were going. So, and we didn't have railroads. So most of what we were shipping at the time that the constitution was written and when they were thinking about the commerce clause was, you know, we were making canals, we were moving goods through shipping. 
So that's where the idea of a navigable water comes from. Over time, Congress and the courts, the federal courts have upheld this or expanded this, including the Supreme Court. There's been this idea that there are certain uh, other non like business related, but commerce and the idea of like folks being able to move and enjoy resources and, and transfer from one area to another or from one state to another, like just humans like you and me, um, that some of that comes under the Commerce Clause as well. Some of it comes under certain amendments, but a lot of that comes under the Commerce Clause. <clears throat> so the idea of a navigable water is historically rooted in the idea of you could be shipping things, but over time has developed and certainly since the 1970s, there's been a lot of case law that has expanded it so that it includes water systems instead of thinking solely about um, you know, can I put a boat down a stream? At the end of the Clean Water Act analysis, you do have to be able to put something into a navigable space, um, meaning like, you know, one day it gets to a water source that is involved perhaps in things going across states, um, but it doesn't have to be limited to like putting a boat in that space. So for example, the Colorado River, um, we don't see a lot of shipping on the Colorado River, but the Colorado River is really critical for uh, energy production, particularly hydroelectric production for several states. And it's critical as a source of drinking water and irrigation water for most of the Southwest. Um, from Texas all the way over to, to California. That's all, all of the coordination that happens under that is a combination of the Commerce Clause power from the federal government and the states literally contracting with each other at like a sub-federal level to manage this shared resource that's known as a water of the United States. So it's not involved in necessarily business commerce, but it is involved in activities that are related to the commercial process writ large and that are really critical for the health, safety, and success of these different communities um, at the local and state levels. And so I think um, it's important not to get too confined in how we think of commerce, but I think the question is intuitive and is a good one because that's certainly how Justice Alito sees commerce. He wants to like narrow the scope of the Clean Water Act to literally bodies of water that you can put a boat on that are probably crossing state lines. Um, and that's not consistent with the development of, of law around um, environmental protection and water. Um, but it's certainly consistent with his prior opinions where he he just thinks we the federal government should not be involved in, or that's maybe an overstatement, but I, I feel like he feels like the federal government should not be heavily involved or not have as broad of a scope to be involved in environmental protection. Thank you for that. That's very, yeah. I don't know if that was helpful. It might be an unsatisfying no, answer, but <laughs> no. I think I think that it, it was really helpful, and yeah, especially if you're a non-lawyer, when you hear commerce clause, you do not you do not think about how broad that that actually applies. Um, Peggy, I'm going to turn to you now about a question about Sackett and how Sackett might affect restored wetlands, whether or not restored wetlands might be protected or not protected now under Sackett and um, what factors might be considered when you're trying to determine whether they are protected. Great question. Um, as we um, see on the landscape now, restored wetlands are probably gaining more and more importance. Historically, for those who don't know, um, I mentioned uh, where you have a project that could impact an existing wetlands. There's um, a requirement under Virginia and frankly federal law that um, the project to the extent possible avoids making those impacts, minimizes those impacts and, and compensates for those impacts. The compensation can take a number of forms. One of the forms is to um, build or restore uh, a wetland. Uh, in other words, to add to, if you will, the wetland stock in a region, and then typically protect it by putting it in uh, what is in essence a conservation easement. Um, so that's one way that you get restored wetlands. And as development uh, grows, uh, the demand for restored or newly created wetlands uh, also grows. So we'll see more of that. How are, how are they affected by Sackett? Much of this will depend on where they are located uh, because the Sackett test 
again, many of us are all trying to figure out how all this is going to happen, but the Sackett test, generally speaking, is that a, a water body, wetlands or otherwise, must be connected uh, in a visible surface uh, connection to a navigable water, as Camille just described. Um, lots of nuances, as you know, associated uh, with that definition, but um, so long as there is that connection, um, I, they should be protected um, and um, would in any event uh, have um, protections based on the, the, uh, the, the instruments, the uh, conservation easement, for example, that protects that wetland. So I think they are not the, the area of most concern um, in terms of what Sackett could do uh, to our loss of wetlands broadly. Uh, but I think it's a really thoughtful question. And I think we'll, we'll see that there's lot likely to require some more thinking about and also to see how that plays out in different landscapes with different climates. Yeah, I think a lot of this is just going to be wait and see. Mm -hmm. um, and a question that is related to that for you, Camille, is um, how how might the term relatively permanent be applied <laughs> to uh, Good luck. <laughs> a lot of, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. A lot of those no, it's... that you were showing, you know, the, the wet, uh, the arroyos, the intermittent streams, um, how do you think those might fare under Sackett? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a way in which they could fare not badly. <clears throat> and here's how. Um, I think that Congress or EPA could ask um, states to designate which waterways are relatively permanent and for example set like waters of the united states kind of through a more collaborative process i actually think that might work in conservative southwestern states like arizona will tell you what an arroyo is um and they won't build in it and it, it's interesting because i think a lot of people i think one of the things that's going to be confusing is that Sackett is based on section 404 which is about filling in land it's not based on like this permitting system but the fear is that um, because navigable waters is used throughout the act that a definition of one section will be applied to the other sections as well so um so another good example of like something that i, I have never seen have water in it in my entire lifetime <clears throat> as a californian is tulare lake which used to be the largest inland freshwater lake in the in the country literally the country and um went dry shoot like decades ago before I, I was born in 1983 Tulare Lake was dry before then um, and it went dry mostly because it was um, siphoned off for agricultural purposes um, this year Tulare Lake had water in it and it became an issue because people had built into part of the lake bed um, but the original lake bed has been preserved as a wildlife area and that became that I think is really interesting because there's a lake that hasn't had water for decades, mostly because of man made reasons it would have naturally had uh, water but we've diverted the rivers we've got massive irrigation projects we've sucked all of the water out of surface water in California. Um, and, I, you know, if you talk to people from the region, they would tell you Tulare Lake is a lake, even when it's dry. Um, and so I think that's a really good example of, of what we're going to be contending with. If you look in Arizona and New Mexico, they call their rivers that are arroyo, like they have dry rivers and they call them rivers. The arroyos are arroyos and it's a term of art. Um, California has some building in like Arroyo Seco, for example, or Seco. Um, in the Pasadena, Los Angeles area is quite large and actually does have a lot of housing built into it. But if you look in Arizona, Utah, Colorado, parts of New Mexico, for the most part, they don't build in the arroyos because they know that if there's a rain, a flash rain or flash flood, it would be catastrophic for people to be there. Um, so they, instead what they've done is they've converted a lot of their arroyos into parks. So this is kind of a meandering non-answer, um, <laughs> but I think uh, what I was trying to get at is I do think that there is room for stewardship, and I do think that um, if folks can collaboratively kind of keep stuff out of the Supreme Court for a while, I think that would be a good thing, and perhaps one of those ways is to leverage the cooperative federalism between the federal government, 
um, given that we have a system of prioritizing waterways, perhaps there's a way to work collaboratively with states, um, particularly states that have these intermittent streams. I think it's going to be more uh, controversial in areas that are ex experiencing climate change that is now making their streams intermittent that haven't been historically intermittent, um, and that also do not have a history of very strong environmental protection at the state level. Um, there are certain red states that do environmental protection. Um, not a lot of them anymore, but you know, historically this was a bipartisan issue because destroying the environment has a bipartisan effect on everyone involved. And so um, there are still states that still kind of have that ethos and perhaps not on all waterways or on all water issues, but there are certain critical issues on which they will unite. And I think um, there may be some room for advocacy there. But I think that, you know, if you ask Justice Alito, he will tell you the LA River is not a river, Tulare Lake is not a lake, Arroyos are not Arroyo, like they're not waterways, they're not, they don't have water. I think he would say it needs to have water more often than not, or more than half the year. That was kind of what he hints at in his, um, in this decision and in his prior opinions that are on the Clean Water Act, he tends to hint at the idea that dry means like periodic because of drought it doesn't mean uh, that it's dry more often than it's not and in the southwest things are dry more often than they're not right i think there are some southwestern states that that would be the vast majority of the water bodies right so it's a lot of yeah peggy had good statistics on this it was what was it peggy was it 97 percent of or was it you corey that it was 97 percent of arizona and 100 percent of new mexico Yes, I, I think that that's right. Yeah, it's it's a lot. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, Peggy, there's a question about how Sackett might impact the creation of TMDLs, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, that's a, another really interesting question. Um, <clears throat> on a, a very high level uh, approach, I would say, um, as, as others have mentioned, uh, wetlands, um, whether they are in the uplands, the far highlands, the, you know, the source of our rivers or the tidal areas, play a really important role in uh, cleaning up the water. The, the ecosystem services provided by wetlands are very rich. They specifically, among those services, help to reduce the nutrients uh, in waters uh, and to uh, get them down to, to ensure they are at levels that maintains a healthy environment, that, that at levels that are consistent with water quality standards. So in that general sense, to the extent we focus on non-tidal wetlands, which I think is where we're gonna see most of Sackett's effect, the elimination of federal protection could lead to uh, greater impacts to non-tidal wetlands, loss of those non-tidal wetlands and loss of those ecosystem services, including reduction of nutrients and other pollutions, other pollution. And that would then allow for the downstream uh, waters potentially to, um, to be more polluted. But it would be a very con complicated study that would be required to address that because um, it, it would entail having a conclusive answer, which I don't have today, on you know, which non-tidal wetlands are uh, outside the new waters of the US arising from Sackett and which are not. So um, again, I think it's very context specific. Uh, but I, but that's the general area that I see that wetlands uh, help to, through all the services they provide, to keep our, our waterways uh, unpolluted, and um, and and those those are uh, essentially irreplaceable services. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out on the land. Yeah, it seems like it would be safe to say that we'll probably need more TMDLs without the protection of those wetlands, right? Because we're going to lose all those ecosystem services. Yeah. yeah. More TMDLs that are actually implemented and, you know, um, carried to carried to their term, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, 
Camille, a similar question for you. How might Sackett impact groundwater regulation and the decision in County of Maui? Hmm. I don't want to think about it. Well, no, um, <laughs> well, you know, the County of Maui is relatively recent and comes from a conservative court. I think it's a really good example of, um, I mean, I don't think the court is is on board with the Alito position that groundwater in the context of County of Maui um, should not be considered under the Clean Water Act when it has a nexus to surface water. Um, that's long been this, the law of several states in the West. Um, so, so I guess maybe I'm I'm a bit of a Pollyanna, but I'm optimistic that because that came from a conservative court, there's not enough votes to overturn it. So I'm hopeful that County of Maui remains good law. The hardest part about um, cases like County of Maui is proving that the groundwater has a nexus. So a lot of money goes into the hydrological and engineering studies to establish that the nexus is sufficient and um, significant enough to bring it under the Clean Water Act. So it's, it's actually kind of difficult to prove um, a groundwater pollution case. Um, it, it, even under County of Maui as it stands. So I'm hopeful that Sackett will not actually roll that back, even though I think um, you know, I, County of Maui was kind of brave of, or not brave of the court, but it was it was a little bit of a departure from the way that the court had dealt with groundwater in the past, which is that they said like, we're not gonna deal with groundwater because you can't put a boat on groundwater. Um, like it's definitely not navigable and it's historically not regulated the same way as surface water. Um, and so I think, because a conservative court put its neck out a little bit on County of Maui, I don't, I don't think that um, the current court has the appetite to roll it back. You still have several justices that were in the majority on County of Maui who are on the court. So I'm hopeful that they won't wanna, um, I, I, I don't know, it doesn't come up often enough to be frankly honest for them to go af after it the way they went after um, wetlands and Sackett in my opinion. Well, and I'll, I'll just add um, one specific instance that I'm aware of that actually was not successful. It preceded County of Maui, but it involved a, a coal ash pond uh, in our tidal areas where the discharge of the effluent from uh, the coal ash went, was proven by a trial court after a full trial to have originated in the, in the coal ash ponds and to have gone through groundwater to reach the adjacent stream. Uh, and the stream itself is, you know, plainly Clean Water Act um, uh, uh, governed. So uh, the case ultimately died on other grounds later on, but uh, we will see, we will see the cases where um, that functional, um, functional, uh, uh, what's the word, functional uh, equivalence um, will, will come up in lots of different contexts. So it should be really interesting and, and frankly, very important. I think we have time just for one or two more questions. Um, and I'll direct this one to you, Peggy. So um, there's a question about how Sackett might affect executive order 11990, which is an executive order that protects wetlands. It was issued in 1977. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Actually, I'm not familiar with it. 1977 would have put it, if I'm right about this, uh, in the um, conservative administration, right? This was the Jerry Ford administration. Am I thinking I think Carter. Car oh, Carter, absolutely. So, um, <laughs> so no, and I asked that question because of course an executive order is issued by, uh, in this case, the president. And so it matters uh, in that sense to sort of think about who is the, uh, who was the executive. So working on generalities and assumptions here, my own, and that may be wrong. Um, my guess is it was a really important executive order for protecting uh, wetlands. Um, that's all I know. Um, executive orders have an interesting history. You know, they are definitely the law that governs federal agencies during the term of a president their effect thereafter, you know, is kind of questionable. It sort of dissipates pretty quickly. So um, I would say it would be hard to make a credible case that uh, it would stand in some way 
to help us hold back against uh, the force of Sackett. Um, I think we'll have to uh, recognize that that was a great moment in history um, <laughs> and that we could go back to it for ideas for what we can try to do in the future, but it wouldn't be considered governing law. Yes, or when maybe we're just feeling depressed about the current situation, <laughs> we can go back and revisit that executive order. Right. Yeah. Um, I have one. Yeah, and it might. Oh. Sorry, I was going to say it might help also to understand kind of the um, the order of authority we call it um, among lawyers. So an executive order is kind of at the bottom of the list of of things that are controlling. So like Peggy was saying. Um, an executive can, can order can inform what federal agencies do. It certainly is in effect until it's repealed. But if you're in an administration that doesn't want to repeal it, but also it doesn't have a policy priority, it might not get much traction. As a functional matter, like Sackett will trump the the interpretation of the Clean Water Act under Sackett trumps an executive order to a certain extent, and the Clean Water Act trumps an executive order as well. What typically happens is you try to harmonize the two. And I think that's what historically the Army Corps of Engineers in particular has done with executive order, um, the executive order that's being cited. Um, but I think it's important to know that that you can functionally overturn an executive order without having to actually litigate and vacate it. Uh, the legal regime can change if, if it's higher level court cases and statutes and that those can deprive a, um, an executive order of its power, even if the executive order is technically in force. Um, it's kind of the lowest in terms of power. The less process you have, the less um, legal effect you have, I guess is what I would say. And so, you know, statutes have a lot of pro process because they go through Congress and we elect our Congress people and um, regula regulations and rules have a lot of process. And so they get less deference than a statute, but, you know, we think about them. So I, an executive order has no process for the most part. And so it has very, um, it's very weak, all things considered. It can be used effectively, but within the boundaries already set through case law and statutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Camille. I think that that is probably a good place for us to wrap up here. Thank you to both of our panelists and for entertaining a very hot bench, I'd say, of questions, especially with, with Sackett. Um, and thanks to the audience for attending and asking asking a lot of these really interesting questions. I, I Like I said, I think that we're gonna, um, we're gonna be playing wait and see when it comes to Sackett, at least for the next several years. So, and I will pass it over to Madison now. Thank you all so much for speaking at today's webinar. I really so appreciate your time and your efforts to educate our audience on environmental law. We appreciate you diving into the Clean Water Act and also spending so much time answering our audience's questions today. Um, and thank you to those in the audience for tuning in. We really appreciate your engagement. Please join us back at 12 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays throughout June and July for the rest of summer school. Coming up next, we have our land use and energy law session taking place at ELI's office in Washington, D.C. next Thursday. Um, that will also be recorded, so if you're not in D.C., um, please look for it online probably at the end of next week or the beginning of the following week. Um, the Thursday after that, we will be taking a break, um, taking one week off, and then after that, three weeks from today, we'll be here again for our virtual summer school webinar on the Clean Air Act. Please remember to register on ELI.org if you would like to attend future summer school sessions. Thank you again to our audience for attending and to our wonderful speakers, Corey, Peggy, and Camille for their presentations. We so appreciate your time and we hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.